Loop Hero from Four Quarters is categorized as Indie, RPG, Strategy, but I beg to differ. Well, obviously not with the Indie part, that's crystal clear, but I definitely think placing it in the same box as titles like Baldur's Gate, Mass Effect or Divinity is stretching it. In a role-playing game, as genre suggests, I expect to place myself in the role of a certain character and live through a story that ebbs and flows depending on my decisions and or actions. In Loop Hero's case, I might as well ship myself, the story won't budge, and as for placing yourself in the hero's shoes, well, let's just say, I don't often wonder how amazing it would be to walk around and around and around in circles for hours. Admittedly, the game does deliver some RPG-like elements. You start out weak, gain power through accumulating experience points, you'll tweak stats, and the game comes with three basic as boss fantasy characters, the warrior, the rogue, and the necro, but let's not pretend this is enough to be an RPG. Strategy, I can accept more, it'll come in two forms. On one hand, you'll be tasked with building a deck of cards that you'll be using, and on the other, using these cards, you'll build a world of adventures almost like you were playing a city builder. You can also add to this blend of genres the procedurally generated nature of roguelikes and the combat system of auto battlers. Right, so we've established Loop Hero is the result of a game dev patchwork workshop, but what the hell is it all about? Well, core concept is, you'll select one of the three aforementioned classes, build a deck of cards to your liking, and embark on a journey of going round and round on a road, thus the name Loop Hero. Sounds admittedly pretty shit so far, but this is where your genius interior, or in this case exterior, design skills come into play. To avoid our hero dying of boredom, you'll build a world around them. See, the surrounding world will randomly spawn apple jellies that on death have a chance to drop various items, resources, or the cards of the deck that you built prior. These cards actually represent elements of this world and you wield the power of placing them back. You'll have cards that transform the road into swamplands, crypts or villages, others would spawn layers of ginormous spiders or vampire mansions on the side of the road, whilst the third category is to be placed as quasi-background offering passive bonuses such as increased HP or attack speed. As you populate the world around you, the many biomes will keep spawning monsters that are unhappy with your presence thus are to be killed via an auto-battler system. Should enemies spawn, and should you reach their spawn point, you'll be put into a sequence during which you sit back and watch the fight play out. Hopefully, you're strong enough, come out victorious, and on death, of course the monsties will potentially drop more items, more cards, et voila, loop number two. As you farm enemies, you'll also receive XP from killing them, eventually lending you a hopefully juicy passive trait that'll make things die easier. This loop within your loops will continue until you repopulate the world enough so that the act boss would summon and you get a chance to beat them into the bricks or space or whatever your journey took you. Now obviously, the main idea is you'll be sent home crying the first couple of times, even if you manage to get to this point, as starting out, you're in fact not Conan, but his long-forgotten younger brother Noodle, who was often beat up by the tribe's newborns. Luckily, almost at any point, you can decide to retire from your current delve and take home some or all of your gathered resources, which you'll use to upgrade your camp, thus gaining further passive strength increase and going back in stronger than before. This is, indeed, level 3 of the loopception. I've got to say, not only is this triple layered core gameplay loop easy to pick up, but it is just as addictive. If you're like us, all too familiar with the feeling of just one more turn from playing games such as Heroes of Might and Magic, Civilization or such, you'll feel right at home with the concept of just one more final loop eating into greater and greater chunks of your life.
Unfortunately, this is further assisted by the game's slow speed. Even though you are granted an option to trigger a 2x multiplier on your adventuring speed, this option should be way higher, especially given how battles are never sped up, and in case you want to interact with either the world as in playing cards, or your character through equipping items, you can always slap one of the many pause keys and take your time without missing practically anything. To add salt to the wound, should you need to take a break mid-run, because god forbid life demands so, you have the options of leaving your game running or saying hard fed goodbye to your run, as there's no save or continue functionality. I would assume this is to prevent players safe scamming their way through the game, but there's absolutely no multiplayer aspect of Loop Hero, therefore doing so would only result in you shitting all over your own game experience, as far as I'm considered, everyone has the right to do so. On a more positive note, as easy as it is to pick up the game and start running your loops, there's a surprising level of depth. You can sink a lot of time into discovering all the interactions between cards, figuring out how to build synergies between your deck and your character, figuring out optimal ways to interact with the playing field and many other aspects. On the other hand, one of the main weaknesses of Loop Hero is the huge variance it brings to the table on many fronts. You can experience variance mid-run, as in one moment you're slapping baddies left, right and center, next a tile will sit you right the fuck back in the corner without any warning. You'll come across highs and lows when comparing runs, the same exact build and power can lead to a boss kill or death on loop 3 simply because of item drop rates. See your surroundings will increase in power level after each completed loop, so just one or two loops without any major power increase through loot and or passive skills can be detrimental. Rogues seem to be least affected by this due to their unique itemization mode, but the necromancer that is extremely item dependent suffers a lot. Last but not least on the topic of variance, there's the card drop situation. It feels as if you get an outrageous amount of land drops, Remember, these are the cards that grant you passives in the background, which is fine by the time you reach endgame and have populated the areas around the road as you wish, but early on, not getting anything to spawn monsters can straight murder your run. I'm sure there's some reasoning behind the drop rates, but to be honest, it just feels shitty to look at loops without any progression. I'm sure a system which would guarantee a feature drop on every let's say 5th or 10th or whatever card wouldn't hurt anyone. As for the overall experience, I'd wager you could be looking forward to a 30 something hours experience from start to beating the last boss for the first time. Would love to tell you an exact figure, but I'm typically the guy that boots up a game, starts playing then gets distracted and leaves it running for a few hours before returning, so my current circa 54 hours isn't exactly accurate. Nonetheless, if we go with an estimation of 30-35 hours, I'd say you'll seriously enjoy the first 20, then you'll encounter a huge farm dip that would maybe take you 10 hours or so, of just jumping into runs over and over again to grab hold of specific items to give you that extra oomph you need to squeeze out victory, and in the last 5 hours you'll once again feel great, edging slightly closer and closer with each boss attempt, until the satisfying catharsis. Any of you with a knack of mathematics might have noticed this actually equates to approximately 25-30% of game time being spent on farming which is, indeed, the sad reality. It's going to be tedious, it's going to be jarring, only saving grace being the fact that I'll spare the nature of the game, most of this will be done automatically, you can occupy yourself with something else in the meantime, but then again, what's the point of playing a game without playing it? This, however, is my greatest and possibly single big gripe with regards to gameplay, everything else is quite solid. Presentation-wise, Loop Hero has absolutely nothing to be ashamed of. 
Obviously, your hero character isn't necessarily a work of art, neither are the monsters if you look at them on the overworld view, but even there, the environment definitely shows a lot of care and attention. And once you get into combat mode, that's where the wonders live. Those sprites are colourful, well animated, just a pleasure to look at. Sounds are mostly charming, even though combat sounds do get old sooner rather than later, but the music compensates for that all the way. During my 50 something hours of playtime, I've yet to come across a bug, glitch or game crash. The game runs smoothly, without the slightest hint of slowdown, even during periods of multi-hour sessions. You'll also find Loop Hero comes with a hint of accessibility options at your fingertips. For those affected by reading difficulties, either a less stylized or a dyslexic friendly font is available, and there's also a mysterious setting called Alternative Timing Method, which supposedly aids in case the game would freeze, but as I experienced none of that, I haven't turned it on, so can't speak of experience in this regard. I feel the attention to detail is overall satisfying, even if some things would be slightly hit and miss. For example, if you play the warrior class, your main build options would be vampirism, i.e. lifesteal, counterattacks, damage reduction or evasion. During any given run, you'd easily recognize items with these properties, as the ones that look like the standout equipment of a Roman gladiator would give you counter percentage, Vampirism equipment would be easy to recognize as well, as they all have wings and edgy properties and so on, but should you swap character and play Necro or Rogue, this luxury would be gone as well. Items of either of these classes can look however they feel like and generate any random property most of the time, leaving a feeling that in this regard a lot of attention was paid to detail at the beginning of development but getting somewhat tired towards the end. I also had a similar feeling with regards to tooltips, or to be more precise, the lack of them mostly. You'll find tooltips looking at buildings in your camps, you'll see what stats items give during your adventure, but you'll never exactly get to figure out what on earth these stats bring to the table, how exactly do they affect your gameplay. There is for example, a popular necro stat combo for items, which would give you summon quality and attack speed. You see, summon quality upgrades your baseline useless skeletons into badass damage dealers or tanks. It's obvious that the higher you stack this stat, the higher the chance to get better skellies. Attack speed on the other hand, to date, I have absolutely no idea how this stat would benefit you. It seemingly doesn't affect your summon rate in any way, as in you don't summon skeletons any faster, it gives no bonus attack speed to your skeletons, as that only depends on their actual level which is governed by a different stat, so the only remaining option is that it literally increases your attack speed, which you would only use in case all your summon slots have already been filled, and you have nothing else to do than auto attack. You can imagine how useful this is. I'm genuinely fine with not knowing mechanics when I start a new game. I'm also willing to accept the popular roguelike concept of only revealing mechanics of collected items after picking them up, even though I'm not entirely sold on this idea, but not having but the very vaguest of ideas of a basic mechanic of a game 50 plus hours in is just rubbish if you ask me. Perhaps worth mentioning a minor gripe of mine, as you head into the mid-game, you'll start recovering memories from runs, which is a way to learn more about the lore and the surroundings as it unlocks fluff about practically anything you've come across. It's a cool concept, I just wish you didn't have to one by one click through everything to unlock those lore bits, but rather they just fill up randomly or in some given pattern and save you the completely unnecessary hassle. We'll now go through the entire story of Loop Hero, so if you want to keep it unspoiled, I suggest you skip to the verdict. Right, 
So it was just another shitty Monday in our nameless world, when suddenly everything started going dark and apparently faded away into nothingness. Space was gone, time was gone, almost everything seemed to disappear, with the exception of our hero, a few fading memories of his, and of course, Skeleton Jesus posing in the sky while doing a good job of erasing existence. Our hero builds a base camp and starts his journey of recovering memories and restoring the world. Upon returning from the first journey, to your surprise, you'll be addressed by Yota, a woman who claims she's been around all this time, actually with a group of further survivors who live with you in the camp. You just seem to have not noticed them the first time around, and by the time they would have approached you, you left. They are however super happy that you've returned, as this is a feat no other is capable of. They're also unsure how many even survived and ended up here, as there seems to be a constant ebb and flow in the number, as day in and day out, more previously unnoticed equipment would appear around the camp, or food rations would be found as if someone just left recently. Unfortunately, as mentioned, none other than our hero is capable of returning from a journey, so everyone will have to stay and rely on us to collect material to improve the camp, and more importantly, hopefully gather enough strength to restore the world as it used to be. Upon your journey, you'll occasionally come across a scene or two when you first meet a new enemy type and enter conversation with them of restoring the world, maybe working together, and our hero seems to become torn by moral dilemmas regarding whether or not it is correct to restore evil to the world, but ultimately these side arcs don't end up going anywhere, which is a pity. Upon reaching Skeleton Jesus, you get to know him as Lich, and he seems to be just as puzzled about your existence and role as you are about him erasing everything. Understandably so, you don't manage to reach mutual grounds and after you beat him up and demand he restores everything, he regrets to inform you that he can't, he already performed his task and that's all he is really capable of. He also hints at there being another he and that you're likely connected but he says that you wouldn't understand anyway, so there's no point of explaining. By defeating him again, you'd also learn he's just a replica of a former image you defeated, and that the cycle of resurrection is practically impossible to break, no matter how many times you would kill him. Having failed to restore the world, you set out to find the mysterious he that was mentioned, but instead, you actually come across a she, the priestess. She politely asks you to stop attempting to halt the end of the world as we know it, as it's obviously a complete waste of everyone's time and effort, and if that wasn't enough already, it's considered quite impolite to go against God's will. Now why God would have decided to destroy what he created isn't something you would learn from the priestess, her fanaticism results in just accepting that anything is as supposed to be. Upon her death though, we at least learn that in fact this is not her first death either, she also comes back to continue her mission, should anything go wrong, and, as a side note, we also learn that the Lich is actually called Omicron. Moving forward with your quest for answers and saving everything, your next roadblock is the Hunter, who appears to be just as insane as fanatical the Priestess was, and apparently couldn't be bothered any less by the whole end of everything idea as long as he can hunt. As such, he can't be asked to reveal any additional information on death, but instead, on your second meeting, he hints that the priestess was indeed correct and the one behind all of this is in fact God, and also that he's sort of not himself as of late, as if he was going crazy. Also, during his second death, he too confirms that you are indeed in some manner connected to God. As you might have guessed, the final opponent will be the creator himself, Omega. Well, more or less. See, after being done with all his creation shenanigans, humans were the creations he liked the most. Actually, so much so that he would regularly take on their form and join them in different worlds, 
not only to essentially bask in his glorious work, but to derive joy from being there. It was one of these self-indulging occasions that went wrong, and, upon noticing his appearance, a human, scared by his light, grabbed hold of their weapon and attempted to kill him. Now, considering how in essence that spear was also one of his creations, it had no business hurting him, but he was so surprised by the creation lashing out against its creator that he figured why not go along with all of this and allowed the spear to pierce his heart and he actually died. At the same time, another version of him was reborn at the very center of creation, this time around though, instead of aiming to create, the new god wished for nothing but destruction and to return everything to a state before his creation spree. Turns out you're actually the closest living relative to the man that took arms against God, and he tells us the reason we got this far is basically so he can end our existence with his own hands, which would all be due to sentimentality he acquired while in human form at some point. Also, that he is willing to give you a chance to defend your world because just, well, basically just because he's curious. Remember Yota? The woman who approached you upon your first return to camp? Well, upon defeating Omega, she appears once again and, well, turns out she's actually a goddess in her own right, as she is probability itself. She wasn't actually created by Omega, or under his original name Alpha. She has always existed just as he has, and like many more gods have. She actually really liked the creations of Omega's previous form and didn't want it to be destroyed, so she decided to create a probability for something to exist in the world that is capable of defeating Omega and stopping the destruction. She basically gives an explanation to the entire game as she says everything that you have accomplished and everything that you have failed at so far has also happened just as you managed to kill Omega. To me, this means you've basically played a single sequence in a multitude of dimensions or alternative realities. In one of these realities, you've been killed by the priestess. In another, you just went out to gather some wood. In one of these many realities, you actually went the distance and killed all three cronies and the big guy himself, as during Act 4, within a single run, this is essentially what you have to do. Upon Omega's death, Alpha, the good guy creator, is reborn and claims that it's impossible to just restore everything, he'll have to rebuild it all once again, like he had done so previously, but he's willing to do so. Our hero vows to not sit around and wait for that to happen, but rather keep working on collecting memories and restoring them, just as he's been doing all along this journey. Everyone's happy, they bro fist, eat tacos, drink Mountain Dew and end credits roll. Or at least, it seems so. Upon further encounters, we seem to learn killing Omega has actually changed everything, and instead of controlling different heroes in different realities or dimensions, call it however you like, every further loop you make is with the same hero and you just bounce between realities, killing Omega everywhere. We also learn that Omicron, the Lich, was in his own twisted way trying to save everything by destroying it. The Priestess, Sigma, actually knew nothing about Alpha, the creator god, transforming into Omega the god of destruction, and that the hunter's name is Tau, and was originally the guardian of his home planet, but when he realized he can't defend it from Omega, decided to destroy it himself, and thus become a hunter instead of a victim. Loop Hero is something new, something fresh, it's almost guaranteed to deliver around 20 or so hours of fun time before dropping you into the farm pit. Considering its price point of 15 euros before any discount and applying some advanced mathematics, we can easily figure out that for the price of two free cinema tickets, you get the entertainment value of 13 or so movies at the very least, and then, if you survive the farm drop, this number goes even higher. What I'm trying to get at here is that I absolutely have no reason to not recommend Loop Hero at this price point. 
Even if you decide to quit when reaching the value of farming and death, you'll get way more than your money's worth. Not every run is a kill run. Don't forget, you're not supposed to be strong enough to take on bosses for the first few attempts, but rather build up a strong heartland, upgrade a few buildings and then go in for the kill. Thus, it is more important to pay attention to what resource you are lacking and go in to specifically hunt that and return to camp, then to push your luck and waste your time. Experiment. You're likely to come across a favorite class and deck setup pretty soon, but we would advise you regardless keep experimenting as you go. Not only is this important from the perspective of discovering the possible tile combinations and drop sources, but it'll also make your experience more varied and the farm much more bearable. Item level is in many cases more important than item color. It's easy to sink into the usual evaluation routine of colored items being better than greys, but more often than not, item level actually outvalues rarity, especially when it comes to weapons and boots, so don't instantly rule out swapping the fancy level 9 legendary for a grey level 12. Stat tunneling. As cool as it sounds to transform your warrior into a vampire, fully healing after every swing, or becoming a counter monster, punishing whoever even looks at you, due to the nature of the game, it's just not a reliable prospect to be able to deliver, so just don't focus on it too damn hard, try and hit the minimum level of stats once you've figured them out, and then just wing it with whatever rolls around. Obvious exception to this rule would be the Necro class, which is extremely item dependent, but that's a whole other discussion, let's, let's not go there right now. Card timing. Last but not least, as fun as it is to change the world via playing cards, don't forget you're actually not pressured to do so. If you look at environmental cards for example, the weaker ones, like Forests only give 1% attack speed while thickets give 2% for example, you're usually better off holding on to them, especially if you consider how often they come with a downside, as in randomly spawning a summoner building on the map. Instead of just vomiting it all out on the map, why not strategically time the placement? For example, why not wait for you to have an Oblivion card in hand as well? 